to the watershed and people to appreciate it. And we want to have them appreciate it in a, in a safe but a gentle manner. So we're going to try and make a connection there with some walkways and some seating along the river's edge, to get people out there and then um, to help with the neighborhood, you know, the city, when we did the master plan process, the boat works property was still privately owned, but now the city has moved forward with uh, acquiring that parcel. So we're going to have a little more flexibility with what we can do in terms of stormwater management for that. But we do need to get some of the stormwater off of Mills Lane, off of Thayer and off of Hayes and pump it up there. We can't do it by gravity. So um, we're going to put in some sort of a rain garden or some kind of subsurface structure, uh, shallow sur surface structure because of the groundwater levels. And then that'll get us some water treatment. And then we can pump it up into the, um, the storage field. And then also along the embankment, we're going to use that to keep the water from getting into the neighborhood. We're going to collect it and put it up into the field. So, um, Al, I lost the screen. I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, project goals, I would go to, okay. yeah. There you go. So, um, I, I kind of mentioned that, but the one thing I didn't go through is how we also need to be cognizant of rising sea levels and the more intense storms. So right now the base flood elevation for that area is elevation 10 and AVD 88. Um, the only part of the park that is currently above that base flood elevation is actually the, the diamond on the infield of the, of the ball field. So um, we're gonna try and come up with some creative landscaping uh, ideas where we kind of trade off and again with the soft edge where we build up to the 10 so the park is protected, but we're also gonna have areas that are gonna be somewhat, I don't wanna say sacrificial, but that it's okay if they get wet. You know, that's just a natural process. It's better they get wet than the neighborhood. And this is all gonna be done in uh, being cognizant of the fact that, you know, there is the seawall project that could happen and go forward that we need to be aware of um, to protect the neighborhood. And there's other interventions even at the Boatworks property. So it was kind of back to leaving everything together and deciding where the critical infrastructure is, what, what should be able to receive water, what should be protected and how can we protect it? Um, Cause these storms, not only sea levels are rising, but as we were talking about earlier, weather is very variable with the intensity of this, the rainfall storms that we're getting now. Um, I have a chart that I saw just the other day. It's like a 25% each strong. So like your 10 year storm now, is going to be a in in 20 years it's going to be like a two-year storm they're just becoming that more frequent and that more intense that um it's a lot more volume to handle we got to be cognizant of that when we size our infrastructure that we handle these high dur intense duration storms um sean's on where we talked about in the process how we're going to reconfigure the park to maximize uh some of the user options so you You'll see uh, later on when we get into that, we're not really gonna focus too much on that tonight, but there's different parts, uh, activities for different users. Uh, there's gonna be moving the, the, ball, the tennis courts down. We're gonna get a new pickleball court. We talked about a dog park. Uh, that's still got a little roughed up, but we think we're gonna move that into where the, um, the boat works facility is by our rain garden and just have stuff for everybody in the city to come use this park. Because hopefully, you know, once that, Rotary comes in and, and the area is being redeveloped. You're going to get more traffic, but it's not going to be coming through the Riverside neighborhood, but we can get people in there to maximize the use of the park. Um, and then I just want to show these two pictures just because you can see, it's certainly the one on the bottom, that people are kind of just cutting through to get to the water's edge. And we don't want that because you can see it, it kind of destabilizes and it, it can erode along the water's edge. So we're going to provide a, a more secure safer connection to that water's edge. It's one of our goals. I'm gonna go to the next slide. So um, we have a tight timeline on this. I'll go to the timeline over, but we're working within this fiscal year. So we gotta be done by June 30th. So uh, some of the things have already started in earnest. Uh, we did the survey and the wetland delineation. I just got those both back this week. So we can start our design. Uh, soil borings. We're gonna get out there um, 
March 21st and 22nd, those just got scheduled as well. So within a month, I will, I will send that out so everyone has it on their calendar, but we'll go out there probably next week to mark out the initial locations where we're thinking of, of doing it. We wanna get um, groundwater uh, depth, certainly for the field, to, for our infrastructure, but also soil characterization characteristics so we can understand our infiltration capabilities and what we have for storage of it. And then along the water's edge, we'll actually want some geotechnical data too, in case we do an elevated like pier, uh, pile supported structure or a walkway that goes over the salt marsh, that might be a nice cool feature, but we gotta have the proper data for that. So we'll have two days of borings um, and it'll take a couple of weeks for the lab data to come back after that. But even with just blow counts and the descriptions, we'll have some good information for those soil borings. Um, the design process is really gonna be dictated by um, the regu regulatory process, to be honest with you. As I mentioned, there's the area of critical environmental concern, which means we're automatically gonna to have to file um, an environmental notification form through the Mass Environmental Policy Act, the MEPA process. So we'll get that prepared. But what we're gonna do with this process is we're gonna get our concept designs down. We already have the concepts done, but flesh them out in a little more detail in the next couple of weeks. And then um, we'll do a preliminary meeting with the regulators. And through the MEPA office, you can actually schedule a pre-application filing. We did one just last month and you can get members from DEP, from EPA, or we certainly want the folks from CONCOM there so that we can get everyone in the room to introduce the project, give us their initial thoughts so that we're not going, you know, six different stops and then, you know, have to pass on what the previous person said so it's kind of an open conversation it helps kind of streamline people's thought processes get some understanding what we're doing i don't see this as a controversial project in terms of regulatory because again it's an enhancement to a public park we're going to go with soft natural features designs we're going to improve um, water quality uh, certainly control water quantity so there's a lot of uh, positive benefits of it it's just got to be done in a responsible we have to show them that we're going to do it in a responsible and respectful manner. So that's one of the key elements. Um, and then after we kind of get some buy-in on the program, then Sean's going to have to hit the ground running and, and develop more of the, flesh out more of the park infrastructure landscape wise and how we're going to connect the people to the water sheet and, uh, you know, take advantage of all the natural resources that are available in the park. And then we'll tie it all up with a, uh, a design report that'll list out what we've prepared for their design packages. So we're not going to be able, by June 30th, we won't be able to actually file for our permits, but we'll have everything ready to talk about our alternatives analysis, what we considered, why we're going with the proposed plan, what are the engineering characteristics of what we're doing, you know, what kind of storm event it will hold, um, what kind of maintenance issues there will be coming up, what considerations need to be taken into. So all that will be delivered and again, June 30th. So, um, you go to the next one. Oh. Yes, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna comment there where we will have the permit packages completed by June 30th. Um, we have already submitted an expression of interest to the MVP program to move forward to the next task for this project to advance to completion, and we discussed the opportunity to apply for permitting and construction. And we've already received feedback to say that they would only um, fund the permitting stage for the next round because sometimes the permitting takes so long that they're finding that, you know, by the time that it is, um, the permits are granted, that there's not enough time to build within one fiscal year. And in previous years, uh, even last year, MVP was allowing two year projects, but this year they've peeled it back, um, partly because they've been having some issues with the permits taking so long. So yeah. that said, um, so the next round, we have already sort of lined up that we'll be applying, um, but it will just be for the permitting. And then once we have the permits in hand, um, we'll go back for construction dollars through MVP program as well. So and that makes a lot that. of sense too, because we'll have the permit packages all you know teed up and ready to go. It's just that with the timing, like you said, I mean, each process is, is several months and when you have to do them consecutively, you know, that adds up. So it's true. Getting it all done right. with one, within one year is, is a difficult thing, but. Um, okay, next slide. And um, yeah. 
thanks. I just want to interject that there so people knew sort of the direction we're going from here. Sure. Yep. So these are the milestones that we're going to be hitting. And again, it's a, it's a tight timeline that we're working under. So we've already got the first one is, is done in terms of site survey, but we're going to go out in March, do our sediment sampling um, and run it to the labs as well. The engineering plans, we want to have that and I'll kind of go through it in the timeline as well. But th these are kind of what we're either looking for deliverables or, or milestones for this process. I don't want to just read off the slides for you, but you can, you can see what we're doing, we're trying to get it that packed in in this time period. I'll go to the next one now. Yes. I think, yeah, this one actually shows a little better. So it's a Gantt chart. Um, so again, we've already done the delineation, the site survey. We're having our kickoff meeting now. Um, I got the drawings back just uh, this week. So we started on laying out every all the infrastructure for the proposed plan. See how it works actually with. With topography and where the utilities are there are some questions that we're going to need to um to check with the city on some of the electrical infrastructure by the park and everything because if we're going to have a pump station we're going to need to you know make sure there's enough juice to power the pumps and that you know we're not interfering with other infrastructure other plans so that's some stuff we'll be doing the next couple of weeks as we're developing these preliminary engineering design packages and then we, we can overlay the actual park infrastructure too. So kind of be two sets of plans, kind of one that shows the, the subsurface and what's going on in terms of infrastructure and stormwater management, resiliency from the storms, and then one that's actually how the park is going to be reconfigured and laid out. And we're going to look into parking as well. It's not just physical activities, but also parking access. And we have to plan for it both ways for the current access off of Hayes and then future access if, when the Roundabout, is it roundabout or rotary? I always get confused now. Roundabout. 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 <laughs> Once the roundabout is implemented, um, that they can, uh, you know, that the parking works in both in both senses. And it's not actually not that big of a, a change, but we want to make sure it's shown in the plans because again, hopefully this funding comes in. I mean, it'd be great if they both line up together, but it's very unlikely that they're both going to happen at the same time. So you want to be prepared to work under each situation. Um, but you can see really it's coming in March, March through June is going to be a sprint and it's going to be a, a lot of focus and a lot of, you know, pen to paper, running calculations and catching up the plans. There'll be a lot of back and forth, but that's, um, that's the long and short of it, really what we're doing, but we kind of want to just talk with people, make sure we're not missing something or, you know, if there's something we haven't considered or, you know, if people have concerns, we want to, you know, Get out in front of it as best we can so it was one of the good reasons for having tonight so to john's point we'll be looking for our next community meeting will be um roughly uh first week in april uh first second week in april so just be on the lookout for those invitations we'll also post that community meeting on the um on the revere website calendar and, um, bob's got a question uh, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, the whole idea of this under field storage capacity, I think, is one of the more innovative and interesting ideas that came out of the master plan. Thanks to you, John. Um, as I look at the picture that was shown of the flooding, one of many that Loretta has routinely provided to us, the question I ask is, how does and, and you may be addressing this during the course of the next several weeks, but just a general sense going into it. How does the capacity for temporary stormwater storage compare to the rather frightening scene uh, that is depicted in, in that and many other of Loretta's photographs? I mean, it almost looks like it would overwhelm any capacity that we would be able to provide. Now, I'm not sure whether that's true or not, or whether it's only in the most critical stormwater events, but I, I'd just be interested in, in your sense of that. And related to that, you mentioned the outflow, for example, the outflow pipes. I, I think some of them don't have check valves or don't have check valves that work. And, and I think some of them may not be fully functioning. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned the possibility of some seawall work, uh, perhaps, you know, along Mills Ave or 
perhaps at the boatyard or, or whatever. I'm wondering how important these interventions, particularly the storage, temporary storage, um, will depend on those other interventions as well. In other words, is the storage itself capable of making a tremendous difference or does it make a big, big difference if we have these other interventions? And are you looking at those in the purview of what you're gonna be studying and permitting in the next several months? Yeah, so um, Rich and I were actually talking about that yesterday. So that, I mean, that photo that we're showing, that is storm surge overtopping during yeah. a rain event. So in terms of storm surge where the Pines River and the marsh just gets flooded, it's the, the subsurface storage system is not going to make a dent in, ter in terms of alleviating that flooding. You know, that's just, if you yeah. think about it, you're, you're trying to dewater the Atlantic Ocean. It's just, yeah. it's not a feasible, realistic goal to achieve. So, but that, I mean, those are exceptional events as well. And that's something more the seawall project would need to keep out. But what happens if the seawall goes up, you know, because they're talking about um, rising gates, hydraulic gates, the seawall goes up, but it's still going to be raining because usually those storm surge happens during like intense rain events. Then you're recreating a bathtub and there's nowhere for the water to go. So this is like a key function to that. So it does have a place to go. It gets it away from the neighborhood. So you're not yeah. you're keeping the, you're keeping the sea out, but you're not like uh, also keeping the storm water in. So this will be really for high tide flooding during a normal tidal cycle. Mm. Um, so like a king tide is, it, well, there's multiple steps to it. So at Mills Ave, you kind of have where Mills Ave comes and turns at Thayer, there's a dip yeah. right there, right at the boat works. And that's just the easiest part. You, you see it all at, at every tide cycle. It just washes in, in and out. So that needs to be addressed because that's kind of the, the weak point and then you're just getting too much water. But during a regular, your typical, I would say, you know, 28, 26 days a, a month tidal cycle, and you have a high uh, a rain event that happens during that time, that's what this system would be geared towards. So, okay, so uh, th this is essential, but not sufficient in some respects. And we exactly. still need to push on those other matters Absolutely, as well. Yeah. I would exactly. Just, we, we just, yeah. I think, need to keep that in mind uh, as we're doing what we're doing, that you know we have to advocate for those other interventions as well. I take it, however, that the pump station is an essential part of the storage system. In other words, yeah, it's not, absolutely. yeah, okay. The, yeah. the other question I have, and I don't mean to monopolize the conversation here, but I, I presume, I, I don't know what the construction methodology is going to be. When you create the storage, do you do that in sort of a cut and cover operation, then build the field on top of it? Or how does that work? The reason I ask is, I assume the amount of the storage is somewhat flexible depending upon the grade of the field. And since you mentioned that the field is the only thing that's sort of out of the floodplain now, does it make sense to think about increasing the level of the field, which would both increase storage as well as keep the field itself somewhat out of danger, if you know what I mean? Sure, so it's, it's not just the, surface topography that dictates how much storage we get it's also the groundwater level so we think yeah. based on other stuff that groundwater level is tidally influenced so we we think we have about three feet between you know the bottom of the infield and where high water would be so we have that playroom for storage but certainly what we're going to do is we will be bringing it up and leveling it off but because you're in a, a land subject to coastal storm flowage um in, within the floodplain, you kind of have to have some checks and balances. If you're raising here, you got to lower it there. So that was okay. one of the reasons why we want to bring up the field, make it more level. Because it's a bigger field, what we're proposing, than what is out there currently. Yeah. The configuration is a little different. But we're going to offset that by cutting in a little bit with some salt marsh and some living shoreline. And that's why we're going to kind of have our walkway pass through that. So there's some tr trade-offs, for lack of a better term, with our landscape sculpting so that we can, again decide where we want to let the water go to and what we want to protect. Cause that's obviously okay. building the field optimizes our storage by raising it up higher. And that's, you know, I see. Important. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you very much. And 
just to touch on what you what you mentioned, Bob, about um, other projects that need to happen in conjunction with this resiliency effort. Um, we are also um, we're in the midst of a feasibility study for the boatyard right now, um, and that will incorporate um, a potential tie-in to any of the resiliency efforts that are happening at Gibson Park and how they can be tied into the boatyard where there'll be adjacent properties and both recreational facilities for the city under one ownership. Um, so we have a benefit there that we, yep. throughout that planning process, we will um, take advantage of any tie-ins and any additional opportunities that we have because that is the lowest lying area right there yeah. is in the boat yard, which I'm sure anybody on this call is yeah. well aware of, of what that looks like at high tide. Um, in addition to that, we so we do have a feasibility study in place for that now. We're planning to apply for a Seaport Economic Council grant um, for the next round, which I believe is we're looking at probably May um, to get some additional funding to advance plans for that based on the feasibility study. And then as we move further down, as a result of not the master plan, but the coastal resiliency study for the Point of Pine and Riverside that we conducted last year um, on the heels of the Riverfront master plan, um, the recommendations there were for, as, as John um, mentioned, for a seawall there, as right. well as mm -hmm. um, increased drainage culvert, um, culverts there as well. So Great. it's not just the seawall, we have to also improve the drainage capacity um, that exists today. So all of those things have to happen in order for it to be as successful as possible for holding back the floodwaters. So Great. it's a lot of work and they all have to be integrated and we all have to be on the same page with um, communicating between one project and the next. So. We've been lucky that actually John is on the project team with Arrow Street that's doing the feasibility study for the Riverside Boatyard. And as we move forward um, for the seawall and, and other projects um, will okay. remain involved. I also believe the developer is going to be upgrading some of the existing pump stations as well. Uh, John may know about that. Bill may know more about it, but all of those things together, I think are going to make a big difference. So just yeah. to let everybody know, there yeah. are number irons in the fire here and yeah. they do have to, they do have to sort of be coordinated at, you know, at a pretty detailed level as we advance. So but they are underway. So the master plan definitely sparked a lot of activity and a lot yeah. of attention from the state for funding as well. So well done to all of you team members there. Well, and I think just going forward, uh, you know, as we get into the community meetings, it'll be really important to kind of continue to talk about those so that it is, it's, it's not one of these that will solve it all, but it's going to be a collection of these systems together that will, uh, you know, will provide yeah. the, the, you know, the, the benefit, if you will, for lack of a better word, uh, of this together, as opposed to this project kind of solving all of that. We all know that's yeah. not the case, but I think just exactly. maintaining expectations, maybe that's a better way to phrase that and just kind of make sure we do a really good job of kind of, you know, helping the community a better understand all of that as well, Al, exactly. Because it sounds like a lot of water is going to be stored under Gibson Park at a very high level. It sounds like that's, that's going to be a great and be all end all fix, yeah, I mean, but it will actually take more than that to be yeah. to really be fully successful in holding back and protecting the homes in that area. Yeah, exactly. I mean, our, our initial design calculation showed that you know we could store store a four inch storm, which again is almost a ten year storm event now. Uh, under that, I mean, for for the neighborhood, that's that's, that's significant. Huge. Yeah, <laughs> but again, if we got to keep out the tidal surge from tidal surge from the Saugus River, from the Pines River in the Atlantic Ocean, that's that's not feasible. So that's why everything yeah. needs to work in concert in that yet yeah, people understand it's a very complex and there's a right. lot of moving pieces in this process. And so there is a vision, there is a plan to really maximize it, but this there, there's a lot that needs to go into it. And it's 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 a complex situation in, in this area. The language we'll probably still used. be flooding in the perfect storm kind of situation, right? Well, King but that's... Died or... Yeah. You know, but you know, I think we used to use the term there's not going to be a single silver bullet in yeah. hurricane resiliency. Um, 
And, you know, I think the other thing that is really important is sort of the passive use of the park. John was kind of using the term sacrificial. Mm. It's not good for it to flood, but if it floods occasionally, nothing's really going to get damaged. Honestly, DOT may need to come in and, you know, clean up some, some muck or some, you know, some stuff like that. But, you know, it's not like we would ever propose permanent infrastructure that would be damaged by the flooding. And that's, uh, that's, you know, it's just, so it's sort of a, like I said, it's more of a passive use thing. Unless, you know, someday there may be some pop-up things. I mean, that's, you know, hmm. however the community ends up using it. But that passive use is pretty important. So if there is a, a flood event, it doesn't hurt that much. That's true. That's certainly a fundamental part of the strategy for resiliency at Suffolk Towns, for example. You know, they build some things up and then create temporary reservoirs if need be, you know. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, John and I were talking about this yesterday. Think about you know, Hurricane Harvey and the, the Gulf Coast, um, you know, a few years ago. There's no way, I mean, sure, we, you know, John's an engineer, I, I'm not, but, you know, we could design to a 40 inch rainfall event and it would drive the costs way up and it would look mm. horrible. There's only, there's only so much we can do yeah. um, in any case. Yeah, that's that's actually a tricky part too about resiliency. It's it's weighing cost benefits. You know, sea levels rising, storms are getting more intense. But there's there's got to be some kind of a, a a a kind of a step back and look. Well, what's what's realistic for what can be done here? Because you could make something that's you know resilient against sea level rise from 2100 but for 50 years it's going to look really out of place and not be functional mm. and you don't want that in a park so if you can kind of do some offsets where you know this part's going to be more resilient in 70 years but this part is really only going to have like a 10-year resiliency life and you kind of break it up and you you like, again you have to weigh the benefits of each part and how how it works now and how it works in the future you kind of kind of play it out in, in different time frames John, you mentioned you started this as a citizen and now you're ending it as the chair of the Conservation Commission. Things look different from your new perch? No, not really. Um, it's a good project. It's gonna have a lot of positive impacts. So um, it, I don't really foresee any issues. It, it's a good project. Great. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or comments, concerns? No? I'd be interested in Bill's perspective on this since uh, you have to deal with a lot of these issues now and particularly. Yeah, uh, I, I, uh, I'm definitely interested on the boots of the ground, boots on the ground uh, standpoint when we, when we start with the boots on the ground. As far as the area between the like the golf area now and the tennis course where that's always very saturated and flooded, you know, two weeks into after a storm. Yeah. Um, is there, is there any, anything in this for that? Or are we looking to build that up or. So that, that's one of the things we're going to look at and go with the borings. Um, if, if the soils are hydric, there's only so much we can do. Um, but if it's just, you know, if it was laid out and they just kind of, you know, underlaid it with a little bit of clay or something, we can look into that. But we will do some, that's definitely going to be more of a passive area. Um, but we will look into, yeah, that. I, I did notice that when I was out there during the, my, my last flood of, uh, storm event as well. So that's something we got to look into. Yeah, I mean, just just from when I was, you know, in my previous position, cutting the grass out there. <laughs> I've gotten many a lawnmower stuck out there because of... Uh, <laughs> The wet the wetlands are two weeks after it's uh, rained. It's it's been saturated. That's yeah. true, Bill. I've been out there before too, just looking at whatever projects we're working on, and uh, been ankle deep in mud. So yeah, we definitely don't need um, irrigation systems in that park. No, no, <laughs> skip that. Yeah. Especially because we're going for turf. So yeah, <laughs> artificial turf for the multi-purpose field. So that'd be great. Less grass yeah. to cut. <laughs> Less grass to cut. <laughs> Bill's happy. 
but no, I'm definitely interested in uh, seeing this project and you know getting, like I said, boots on the ground and. Right. And you guys have a, a, a stormwater pump station at Point of Pines as well already, right? Or is it just yes. a... Yep. Yeah. So we'll be looking to do something like that. And again, it's going to have to be salt water tolerant just because I have a feeling, you know, again, overtopping is going to happen. Be right yeah, once, one, once we get into that, I can uh, involve my counterpart on the water sewer and drain side. And, and uh, uh, Chris Charamali, he's actually pretty knowledgeable when it comes to the, the pump stations and all that. Okay, that'd be good, yeah. Okay. Hey, just real quick, John, kind yes. of on the permitting side and those discussions more, maybe it's regulatory and maybe, maybe that's the right word. I know, and this was just basing it on some of the discussions we've had with, uh, you know, CZM as it relates to some of the vegetated uh, slopes that we're doing uh, over Gibson Point. Um, and they've been, you know, heavily involved in that. And as we start to talk about some of those areas that are carved away as you described to them that we're kind of giving back to the to the water and the fluctuation i'm assuming they'll get involved with that is that a fair assumption um, once Absolutely, again it's right yeah. at that water's edge i mean they they're 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 a good group it's it's always just kind of a challenge to kind of get the right people in the room to have those conversations so obviously i think planning ahead to kind of get those guys on board or that team uh individuals i shouldn't say guys but the yeah the the the, you know, the, the right people on board to be there and kind of be able to have their voices kind of heard will be really important. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's kind of the advantage that, uh, you know, if we're trying, to, trying to be a positive person. One of the good things that's come out of this this pandemic is that with MEPA, and again, this has will have to go through the MEPA process because of okay. the marsh, you can schedule these meetings and they encourage you to contact all the regulators. So Rich and I just did one two weeks ago and we had CZM there. We, awesome. had MEPA, we had folks from DEP, we had the local CONCOM. Okay. I think seven different regulatory. The only one we didn't get was the Army Corps. Okay. Pretty short staff. But um, because yeah, I mean everyone's gonna have a say and everyone kind of has all parts play together, but everyone has their jurisdiction. And you know, certain right. you know, the wetlands folks aren't looking at the same thing as the waterways folks, but right, you know, everything's gotta work together. So uh, you're right, that's absolutely critical in getting them in early. Um, one of the things that for this project, I want to talk with them about, particularly in CZM, is marsh migration. Because, um, you know, we can design for a salt marsh now, but as I was talking about before, in 20 years, that salt marsh is going to be subtitle. So right. we want to have, you know, on the slope so it can kind of work its way up. And I just want to make sure we're not penalized for that, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's that, or... I don't want to say penalized, but that it's that they understand our process and why we're putting things at different levels that it's just not, you know, we're not just gonna do salt marsh for here for now, but we want to have it so we can migrate it up and that the living shoreline that it, you know, works and that maybe in 50 years that living shorelines, the salt marsh, you know, along those lines. Yeah, and I'll be really curious. I mean, I obviously we had some great conversations as a part of the, the master plan on some of those, uh, what I'll call a little bit more of a boardwalk or elevated walkways. Um, that, yeah, I would love to kind of, as we get into this in greater detail, just to kind of get their read. And, you know, those are always, yeah. you know, great things for the, uh, you know, for the the users um, and just no matter how those are perceived and kind of the thoughts on those as well. And hopefully that's some of that stuff that we could kind of weave into this, because I think it would be from a, you know, a user experience, it'd be awesome. The more I that we agree. can interact with that water to your point of getting to it, uh, whether it's visually or actually physically getting to it would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that, I think that's probably the toughest sell is getting, you know, a walkway through through the marsh that we're creating. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 like you said, I mean, it, this is a public project for the public and there's nothing better than getting out there and being on top of the marsh or, you know, high water being in the marsh, you know. Right, exactly. Really, really cool. So, yeah, I think those are all amazing educational opportunities as well. I mean, uh, just to kind of build upon that. So there's some great stories there that hopefully that can help us sell it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think especially with like the the kayak, uh, you know, launching and things like that. Also, again, it's sort of, uh, you know, it allows for more kind of green, sustainable uses of the waterways also. Yeah. That was one of the best things that came out of the, well, there were a lot of good things. I shouldn't say it that way that came out, but I, I was inspired by the individual who was kind of setting up the, uh, the rowing team effort and I was what I love to hear was 
more about being stewards and more that people are on the water, they become stewards of the water and it's, you know, they're protecting it as well. And so that's, that's a greater good. That's just, you know, that's pretty amazing. So yeah, to kind of build upon those successes would be, would be huge. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a, there's a large interest in for a community that is surrounded by water we really don't have any access points. So it's it's key and you know the acquisition of the boatyard and extending Gibson Park into the boatyard to for a community boating purpose non motorized so it really just gets people out gets people active promotes healthy living and stewardship as well it opens opportunities um, you know if the rowing the rowing teams are there I mean that's something that Riviera hasn't had access to. Um, to joining as a sport. So, I mean, it really, it just creates a lot of opportunity for so many people at so many levels. So I'm glad to see it all moving forward. Glad to have you all back on the screen again. Yeah. Maybe someday we'll all meet in person. Yeah. <laughs> By the time That's it's right. done, we can meet at the park. <laughs> That's right. Come on. I'll tell you though, I'll just to reinforce what you said initially, the progress that has been made from the sort of visioning in the master plan to these various levels of implementation is really quite remarkable. On, on virtually every front of the master plan, substantial progress is being made. I think that's great. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm very impressed, you know, as a, from the outside, the, the actual like speed and commitment to, act, to get stuff done. Cause you know, sometimes you work on those master plans and it's good, but then it just goes sits on the shelf and, and you know, no one tries to follow through on it. And but you know, the city's attacking it from every which angle they can, which is awesome. Because I mean yeah. there's a lot of good stuff in there, so it's pretty cool. Yeah. I might just add it helps to have a development, uh, you know, residential development as part of that, because that drives us all forward as well. Yeah. Also provides a lot of resources and support for our public purposes. Very good. So I'll ask one more time, any last comments or questions, feedback? This is great conversation. Thanks, all, thanks to all of you for joining us. And um, we'll get an invitation out. We'll send it out a little bit earlier if we can um, for April. And so everyone can mark their calendars and make sure that you can attend, spread the word. Um, we'll have more information available at the next session. So it'll be really important if you have friends in the community that you want to extend the invitation to so they'll have their opportunity to weigh in. Hopefully we'll have maybe some preliminary um, information on the recreational side as well. So um, not only the resiliency work, but you know, paired with resiliency and, and where we've landed. We did a lot of work on that for the master plan. Uh, so I think we have some things, you know, pretty much drafted out, but it'll be interesting to see what Sean comes up with to present for yeah. the next time around. That'll be great. And, and John, if you could probably share the your schedule, um, I think what would be helpful, because I, I don't know about you guys, but there seems to be a lot of evening meetings that are starting to happen again, which is great that just things are opening up again. But I would love to kind of at least block out the ones you're thinking about and just kind of get good placeholders on there. And then obviously time dates could just shift around, but at least get those blocked out on the calendar now would be would be great. Okay, we'll try to get those out in the next week, Sean. That'd be great. Oh, yeah, I just uh, it's kind of crazy the way these are starting to creep up again. It's it's a good problem, but uh, I want to make Everybody, sure we get you guys kind of blocked out. Everybody's grants would do at the same time. So everybody's in the <laughs> scramble right now. I was like, we got to get those meetings in. So, yeah, <laughs> we're all uh, vying for the same deadline. <laughs> exactly. All right, guys. Well, great. It's great seeing work. everybody, even in the tiny yeah. little box. And yeah. great to hear all of your comments and feedback. And we'll look forward to the next session and uh, and spring. Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot, Alan. Thanks, all right. John. Take care, everyone. Good night, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Bye-bye.